so um, uh, my lab actually has pretty broad interests. Uh, so, um, so my lab has pretty broad interests. Uh, we are interested in local translation. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we're also interested in, uh, more generally, in how neural circuits uh, can be modified by experience and by activity, um, and what that, how that can be useful for things like learning and memory, but also how it can be detrimental for various neurological disorders, uh, including autism and epilepsy. Uh, and our, our model system of choice is the mammalian hippocampus, uh, and this is a picture here. Through the uh, slice of the hippocampus, I show this to remind myself to give a very shameless plug for a very talented postdoc uh, in my lab there, Jonathan Nickman, uh, who's going to be on the job market for the year. So please watch for her; she is phenomenal. Uh, she's been just a really beautiful work looking at uh, this question of how hippocampus circuits are developed and refined by activity during specific periods in development. Uh, it's actually not related to level translation. I'm not going to talk about it, but. Uh, she's done really elegant work in transgenic mouse models to manipulate different facets of activity and to look in very fine detail at how synaptic connectivity in different hippocampus subregions is altered uh, and uh, at both the structural level and also the functional level. Um, so, uh, another interest in my lab is to understand molecular mechanisms to control synaptic remodeling. Again, in particular, an excitatory synapses in the hippocampus. Uh, there's lots of evidence that this is, of course, important for. Uh, plasticity related to information stores, but also a lot of evidence that dysfunction of these mechanisms contribute to intellectual disability of uh, And lastly, uh, I'm very interested in homeostatic regulation of synapse and circuit function. These are our topics I'm sure you're uh, very familiar with in the work of Aspen Prince and Pete Leonard. Uh, so, um, just to put it into context, I know you probably know a little bit about local translation from Gary's work and from uh, Way things work, but uh, why should we consider local translation as a really important problem for neurons? Uh, and, and I think the problem is really very simple that neurons have many thousands of synapses, and we know that these synapses have unique activity dependent histories, and as a consequence, have unique requirements. And so, how do you, uh, does this one neuron service the unique requirements of 30,000 different synapses? And a very elegant solution is provided by the possibility that. Uh, uh, local resident protein synthetic machinery can supply proteins in a use dependent fashion to individual synapses on, on a sort of need, need by need basis. Um, and this idea uh, has been sort of a, has been swirling around in the literature for, or in the field for a long time. Uh, it was actually originally proposed uh, possibly in the 60s, most eloquently uh, articulated by Ozzy Stewart and his colleagues in the early 80s. Uh, but really didn't gain any real traction, I think, particularly uh, uh, in terms of its physiological relevance until quite recently, really in the last 10 years or so. Um, and this has come from the realization that we know that defects in the control of uh, protein synthesis and synapses uh, can be highly associated with uh, inherited forms of intellectual disability and autism, uh, the most notable which is fragile X syndrome, which is caused by the loss of this mRNA binding protein, <coughs> fMRP. And so fMRP binds and regulates the translation of about 800 mRNAs or so in synapses, and loss of MR fMRP leads to uh, inherited uh, intellectual disability, and uh, it's also the leading cause of autism. So there's a lot of interest in how this local control translation uh, might be dysfunctional uh, in these disorders. Um, uh, in addition, another pathway that I won't talk about today is this pathway mediated by the mechanistic target of rapamycin, specifically when it's complex with a series of proteins, including rapids, we call it mTORC1. And uh, TORC1 is also known to play an important role in controlling translation of, of proteins and synapses. And like we see with fragile X syndrome, we've lost the loss of FMRP. Uh, it turns out that mutations that lead to hyperactivation of mTOR signaling lead to syndromes with uh, some very important clinical overlap. Uh, these, these individuals suffer from intellectual disability, autism, and also higher propensity of uh, seizures, uh, which is uh, symptoms that are shared in fragile X syndrome. So I'm going to talk a little bit about fragile X syndrome, although it's sort of like educated in choir, since uh, many of the, the, the features of it uh, I'm sure you're well aware of. Uh, this is uh, the most common heritage cause of intellectual disability. It affects about 1 in 2,500 boys. Uh, a smaller number of girls because the gene, the affected gene is on the X chromosome. Uh, uh, it's 
one of the leading, it is the leading cause of autism that we know about, it accounts for about two to three percent of cases. Um, and most boys have autistic features, so the high comorbidity of disorders, you know, autism, fragile life syndrome. Uh, many of these kids have seizure disorders, and many of them are hyperactive with ADHD. Of course, uh, you're all familiar with the, with the genetic underpinnings of this disease. The, the disease-causing gene was identified by Steve Warren and his colleagues in here in the early 90s. Uh, and, and the mutations underlying this disorder uh, that, that, that were uh, uncovered by uh, Steve and others uh, over the next several years. Um, and so we know a lot about the genetics of the disorder. It's very interesting. I'm not going to be talking about that. Uh, we're talking about uh, how the gene product uh, might regulate local translational synapses and what that might, uh, might, might mean. But the, the, just by way of, of review, uh, we know that the disease-causing mutation in Fragile X syndrome is um, caused by an expansion of this microsatellite CGT repeat in the 5' uh, uh, untranslated region of the mRNA. Uh, and in the gene, when this expands to over 200 repeats, the gene gets hypermethylated and transcription essentially is shut off. And so, uh, and fragile X syndrome results. And there's very, very strong evidence for this that fragile X syndrome is caused by a loss of the protein product here, the loss of the gene product that we call fMRP. Um, uh, and that this expansion can actually occur uh, over generations, which leads to another state that we call the premutation state, where uh, the typical repeat numbers are about typically on average about 30 or so, um, but these can expand generationally and lead to a premutation state that's anywhere between about 50 to 200 repeats. Um, and I'll talk, that'll actually be something I'll talk quite a bit about uh, in just a second. So what are, what are the consequences of losing this fMRP? As I said, fMRP is a uh, RNA binding protein. It regulates the translation of many of RNAs and synapse. Uh, and it really wasn't clear what the functional significance of this was until actually a very important paper that was published by Kim Huber and Mark Baird and Steve Warren uh, in 2002, where they demonstrated that a form of metabotropic glutamate receptor dependent synaptic plasticity, MORLTE, was selectively enhanced in a mouse model of fragile syndrome where fMR1, the fMR1 gene has been deleted. Okay, so in the fMR1 knockout, and this was surprising when it was discovered, they see that this MORLTE is enhanced. Uh, so, uh, this is looking at, at synaptic strength between CA3 neurons and CA1 neurons on the campus. These are field excitatory postsynaptic potentials, and they're stable, but once uh, an, an agonist of group 1 in is, is applied to the bath, THPG, uh, you get this rapid depression of synaptic strength, and this slowly recovers, but it recovers to a new depressed state. This new depressed state is what we call an LTD, and you can see that it's selectively enhanced in the knockout and the knockout angles. So uh, these fMR1 knockout angles have exaggerated in the oral uh, But they have a really an important feature is that the mechanisms underlying this LTD are also distinct from that in the wild type animals. So Kim had, had shown, uh, again, in Mark's lab and, uh, a couple years earlier in a very classic set of experiments now that this in LTD required local translation and synapses. I won't go through all that data, uh, but we know that in wild type animals, that this sensitivity of, of MLOR LTD to an azomycin protein synthesis inhibitor is because you're blocking that local translation of proteins in the synapse. But what she found, uh, 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 her lab then, when she had her own lab, she demonstrated that, that uh, MLOR LTD in the fmr one nongos is now no longer sensitive to protein synthesis inhibitors, which was really remarkable. So now we know that MLOR LTD is both enhanced and no longer dependent on protein synthesis inhibitors. Uh, in the fr one knockout, which is, is a couple of features that have led and, and strengthened what we know as the MLOR hypothesis of fragile X syndrome, that one of the core synaptic defects uh, uh, with loss of FMRP is this decoupling of uh, MLOR signaling to local control and translation. Uh, so in, under wild type conditions, normally uh, MLOR stimulation, so FMRP is regulating its targets, target mRNAs, it acts as a, typically as a translational repressor, uh, and work, uh, re recent work has shown that MLOR signaling uh, causes dephosphorylation of FMRP, which dissociates from the mRNA and allows their, their translation of their, of their target proteins. And this particular step seems to be lost in fragile X syndrome. Um, in addition, uh, one of the target's mRNAs that's regulated by MLOR signaling is, in fact, FMRP itself. Uh, 
Uh, and we know, since Bill Greeno actually showed a number of years ago, that FRP can be translated in a, uh, in a at synapses in response to Angular stimulation. Uh, and this has been, uh, uh, this was followed up in, in, in Gary Gassel's lab in a very beautiful paper showing that this, uh, these dynamics of FMRP synthesis, trafficking, and degradation seem to allow for a local burst of protein synthesis at synaptic sites. And these important effector proteins here, like PARC and PSD95 and many others, seem to be translated in a, in a sort of bolus. Uh, and that new FMR, the hypothesis was that new FMRP synthesis would act to essentially shut this new translation off by rebinding these mRNAs and acting as a translation repressor. Um, and so this is a very interesting uh, 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 possibility, a very interesting uh, uh, idea, but it's been very difficult to test, obviously, because how do you dissociate the effects of FMRP as a, uh, as a translational suppressor from looking at the effects of newly translated FMRP? And I'm going to talk about a strategy we've used that's an imperfect strategy, uh, uh, to be sure, um, but it makes it also bears relevance to this pre-mutation condition. Um, and so about 10 years ago, it was uh, recognized and, that the premutation condition leads to its own disorder um, uh, uh, called fragile X terminal ataxia syndrome, where this repeat expansion actually leads to over transcription of the, MR, of the, of the mRNA. And this mRNA it, is, a, is a toxic gain of function species. And this has been very nicely demonstrated by uh, lots of labs. Um, and that in elderly patients, it's an age dependent neurodegeneration that takes place. Um, that uh, it's been called fragile terminal ataxia syndrome or fast um, and this is, these are associated with ubiquitin uh, positive uh, nuclear inclusions, um, and uh, and the leading sort of idea underlying the pathology in this disease is that the mRNA is toxic, and the hairpin that's formed from these repeats might actually bind and sequester other RNA binding proteins, contributing to that toxicity. But this also. Uh, uh, and so as a consequence, these uh, pre-mutation model mice were made by, by uh, the same groups. We've actually collaborated with Karen Houston's group, who generated a, a pre-mutation model mouse where 120 CGT repeats were inserted in the 5' uh, UTR of the FMR1 uh, gene. Uh, and uh, as a way for us to look at what the consequences of having this pre-mutation might be for uh, synaptic clusters. And so, uh, uh, in elderly patients, it's very clear that there's an age-dependent neurodegeneration uh, that has uh, limited penetrance, 50% or so, in, in pre-mutation carriers of the disorder. Uh, but uh, it's also been realized more recently that younger pre-mutation carriers might have uh, other uh, propensities that are more typically associated with fragile X syndrome. To be clear, these, these, these kids do not have fragile X syndrome, uh, but they do have a, carry a higher risk for having autism spectrum disorder, uh, uh, assessing compulsive disorder and, and ADHD symptoms. Um, and of course, the premutations are also a common cause of premature ovarian failure in women. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about that, but that's another important consequence and, and important uh, aspect of studying this premutation state. Um, so, uh, so, what are the consequences of having this premutation uh, in, uh, in the FR1 gene? We, we hypothesized that. This might play a role in regulating mBOR dependent signaling. And, and the reason for that uh, is that because of this hairpin that's formed in the mRNA, uh, the translation of the fMRP protein should be dramatically altered. Um, and so, as a first pass to look at this, these are again our mice that, that <coughs> are generating Karen Newsom's lab. And this is a collaboration that I have with Peter Todd's lab in Michigan. Uh, we simply looked at the uh, mRNA and protein expression levels in the cortex and hippocampus of these mice. And these are in uh, relatively young mice, P28, P38, or more elderly animals. And uh, what we found is that the, F, the mRNA is elevated, not surprisingly, this is been reported, but in, in, in these mice it's elevated about between four and five fold in the cortex, so there's a, a huge abundance of the mRNA. Uh, but the protein levels uh, are actually substantially diminished. Um, and this effect seems to get more uh, uh, pronounced as the animals are aged. Um, but even in young animals, there is a, a, a huge increase in mRNA, but a, a, a reduction in protein. And that's true both in the cortex and also in the hippocampus, where uh, we study in rural TV. And this suggested to us that, that even though there's lots of the mRNA, there's a huge uh, deficiency of, uh, for translation. So uh, much of this mRNA cannot be translated, and there's, a, and there's an overall loss of fMRP protein. Now, because of this loss of translational efficiency, 
uh, we hypothesized that this might play a role in uh, affecting the rapid uh, translation of FMRP as synapses in the fossil and Loire stimulation. So to test this, uh, we use a, a biochemical fraction known as synaptic neurosome. So these are uh, pinched off synaptic endings that reseal. And uh, many labs, including Gary's lab, uh, have shown that these are capable of supporting local translation. Uh, and have been a good model system for looking at uh, uh, how particular uh, targets and synapses might be translated uh, uh, by local signaling cues. So in these, uh, uh, so not surprisingly, in these synaptic neurosomes, there's a decrease in fMRP in the, in the CGG knockout animals, uh, the pre-mutation model animals, relative to wild type animals. Um, and that's shown here. Uh, but in wild type animals, when we stimulate with DHPG, so we stimulate group 1 and group Rs, there's an increase in fMRP protein uh, uh, that's made. This was originally shown, as I said, by Bill Brino's lab and repeated here. Um, but in the CG non animals, this rapid uh, translation of fMRP is lost. Okay, so this uh, uh, decrease in translational efficiency essentially prevents the fMRP from being translated in, in rapidly in response to NGUR stimulation. So that's not a biochemical fraction. This has actually happened in neurons. And so to, to look at this question, um, uh, we took advantage of a trick uh, that others have used with excellent disorders where uh, we took uh, uh, male CGG knockout animals with one X chromosome and crossed these with uh, female XGFP animals where they carry GFP on, on both the chromosomes and then examined the female progeny. Okay, so these, uh, 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 these uh, female progeny will have one X chromosome with GFP and one X chromosome with uh, the premutation model. Uh, repeat. So uh, the GFP chromosome will be a lot type chromosome. This will be the, the uh, mutant chromosome. And then we can make cultures from these, these animals, which will be mosaics, where depending on the state of exit activation, uh, if they're GFP positive, then they've inactivated the, um, the premutation chromosome. If they're GFP negative, then they've inactivated the wild type chromosome. Okay, so GFP positive neurons here are wild type, and GFP negative neurons are uh, premutation model neurons. Uh, in these mixed cultures. So you can see, as you'd expect, about 50% of them or so are green, about 50% are not. And in these wild type uh, neurons, we looked at um, fMRP basal levels as well as the ability of DHPG to stimulate them. Uh, and what we found, similar to what we've seen before, uh, is that there's a decrease in dendritic fMRP in the CGG knockout neurons uh, relative to their neighboring wild type counterparts, but also these CGG knockout neurons don't respond to DHPG whereas the wild type uh, neurons do. So there's a loss of this rapid MGOR dependent translation of FMRP in, these, in this pre-mutation model condition. So what impact does that have on MGOR dependent synaptic plasticity? Uh, and we were somewhat surprised by this, but uh, given that there's this loss of, of FMRP uh, translation, it suggests that there might be an impact uh, and might have, that there might actually be a gain uh, 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 again, a function with respect to MGOR LTD. That's in fact what we observed. So, similar to what you see in fMR1 knockout animals, um, when we look at MGOR LTD uh, uh, in field recordings of CA3 to CA1 neurons applied to HPG, um, so here it is in wild type animals, the black bars, you can see that, that there's a stable, uh, persistent depression of synaptic strength, but this is significantly exaggerated in the CGG knockout animals. Okay, a phenotype that's very similar to what we see and what others see in the FMR1 knockout animals. Oh, however, there actually turned out to be an important difference, and that is, in, whereas in the knockout animals, this MGORLT is no longer sensitive to protein synthesis inhibitors, it still in, remains responsive to protein synthesis inhibitors in the CGG knockout animals. So even though the, the phenotype is very similar, uh, the mechanisms underlying this, this MGORLT is actually distinct uh, in these two uh, animal populations. So what this all means, of course, we're not sure. It certainly is consistent with the idea that uh, local translation of FMRP plays a, a role in, uh, as a translational break in preventing runaway uh, synthesis of uh, MGOR effective proteins. Um, and so uh, I showed you this model earlier, um, the way that you know, our sort of working model, and this is really a hypothesis at this stage, is that uh, MGOR, in the CG knockout animals, MGOR signaling uh, to the translational machinery is largely intact due to the uh, uh, existing levels of FMRP that are at synapses, but the ability to translate FMRP is lost. And so, as a consequence, 
these other MVOR targets that are normally regulated by FRP are actually over-translated. Um, and so we don't have any evidence for this aspect of it. We don't see any over-translation of proteins yet. Um, but this is a model that's actually consistent with the known role of MRP uh, as a translational repressor in synapses. And there, of course, are other possibilities um, that we can't uh, ignore, such as some effect of the uh, hairpin, for example, and binding other mRNA binding proteins that might play a role in the RLTD. Okay, so this is, this is a hypothesis that we're uh, exploring. So, um, and of course, it's very likely that in the cases of fragile X syndrome, any in the cases of mTOR apathies, that the defects are not going to be limited to mTOR dependent plasticity. So this really raises the question of what these uh, uh, forms, what, what the how these translational regulatory mechanisms are really affecting uh, different aspects of synaptic function. And a number of years ago, actually while I was a postdoc in, in Aaron Schumann's lab at Caltech, I got very interested in the idea that local translation might play a role in what we now call sort of synaptic homeostasis but really uh, in the homeostatic adjustment of synaptic uh, strength. And this really came from uh, sort of the idea that, that local, tra local translation is uh, conferred upon synapses at considerable cost to so There has to be really an important uh, logic behind it. It didn't seem likely that the only reason to, to spend all this energy to export mRNAs and, and uh, to, to confer protein synthesis capability in dendrites, and all of that was due to these sort of special case scenarios like MGOR LTD and long lasting forms of LTP. There really should be a more online role for it. And so the basic idea is that um, synapses work in sort of an optimum range, and, when, uh, and if synapses get uh, too strong, their performance will be great, particularly because uh, pre and post synaptic elements have to be precisely regulated. So if one side gets too strong, uh, the, synapse, the performance of the, of, the, of the synapse diminishes. If one side gets too weak, it also diminishes. And as a consequence, there have to be uh, adaptive mechanisms that compensate for this loss of activity to sort of push the synapse back into this fully optimal range. And there are lots of ways that we can think of how synapses could drift. We know that there are a whole variety of processes, receptor trafficking, receptor diffusion from extrasynaptic sites, where um, that actually would all, being equal, tend to destabilize synaptic function. So the idea that there are these adaptive mechanisms that are actively trying to stabilize synaptic function is, is, uh, consist is actually been uh, tossed around for, for quite a long time. And we generally refer to these forms of plasticity as homeostatic forms of synaptic plasticity because it's thought that they're trying to maintain a steady, stable level of synaptic function um, uh, by virtue of these compensatory synaptic adaptations. And this, of course, is a concept you're probably very familiar with, with Aspen Prince's work and Pete Wenner's work here. And, um, and that's been variably applied. I don't like it, uh, it seems like my particular rendition of it is it captures all the thinking in the field. We think of these homeostatic mechanisms as playing a really important role in neural circuits, in working on a, a circuit level, working on a cell level, and also working at the synaptic level. And there's actually evidence for all these different possibilities. So uh, I, I'm uh, not really doing the concept justice, but I don't really have the time to discuss it. So uh, that's sort of the rendition you're going to get. Okay? So at the synapse, we think this play a, big, big, a very important role for uh, uh, fine-tuning synaptic strength uh, uh, to keep it in an optimal range. Now, um, uh, multiple different uh, mechanisms have been have been described for this. I'm just going to sort of gen generically uh, uh, give you two such mechanisms. One is where postsynaptic function can compensate, and we know that this is uh, uh, driven by loss of synaptic activity, causes an increase in uh, postsynaptic receptor expression in synapses. And in glutamatergic synapses, this typically is mediated through amber receptors, so you get increased expression of amber receptors when you block either the amber receptors themselves or the MDA receptors. But in other cases, you can see an increase in release probability at synapses as well as a presynaptic form of compensation. Okay. And this is in addition to changes in intrinsic excitability, which we also know are very important. So the question really is, does local translation play a role in this process? And this is a question that we um, uh, have experienced using a combination of imaging and electrophysiology. So if we're, uh, uh, after we've blocked synaptic drive, for example, that very quickly, within an hour or so, you see a compensatory increase in synaptic activity. These are uh, miniature excitatory postsynaptic current recordings. And you see um, that these 
that these currents are very small, and they're also somewhat infrequent, and after this block is synaptic drive and wash out of the antagonist, the adverse of the block are here seeing the UX, you see that not only do the currents get a lot larger, but they get a lot more frequent as well. And the increase in the size of the currents generally reflects a postsynaptic mechanism, an increase in postsynaptic sensitivity to glutamate, whereas the increase in the frequency of the currents reflects the increase in the probability of release under most uh, circumstances. And I'll, um, Talk more about that in a few minutes. So um, this is again work that I uh, that I started when I was a postdoc in Aaron Schumann's lab, and we were interested in whether this postsynaptic compensation uh, required any sort of local translational uh, uh, control. And so in this experiment, we back applied TTX and locally supplied the energy receptor antagonist uh, ADB. And I might turn down the lights here uh, just for a second, just so we can see this. Okay, and so um, what we did is we locally supplied NMD. I'll turn it back on so you don't fall asleep on me. Um, so we locally supplied APB, and then we asked, we did this for 90 minutes, and then asked, and when we looked at surface expression of amber receptors, um, do you see amber receptors accumulating in this local spatially restricted region? Uh, and the answer to this question actually was yes. So this is surface labeling for the amber receptor sitting in blue A1, and you can see that there's enhanced expression of blue A1 that's in the same region where we've locally blocked. NMDA receptors. And so what this shows, uh, and this is shown down here in, in maybe easier to see format, this is a 3D plot of pixel intensity across the length of this dendrite here shown in this, uh, this arrow. And you can see that there's an increase in blue A1 expression precisely at the site that we targeted with NMDA receptor blockers. So walking synaptic drive causes a local increase in blue A1 expression, um, and that's quantified here. Um, Conversely, if we apply NMDA receptor antagonists everywhere, so we back apply them, and then locally supply protein synthesis inhibitors, we can prevent the incorporation of these receptors, specifically at those sites where we block protein synthesis as shown here. So that suggests then that local synaptic signals, um, we're to leave the dark, sorry about that. Uh, local synaptic signals play a role uh, in uh, recruiting glue one to uh, uh, excitatory synapses, and that, that translation uh, near those synapses is, is ultimately responsible and important for getting those receptors uh, stably expressed at, uh, at the synaptic membrane. Um, so this suggests then that local translation can be engaged by uh, synaptic stimuli, um, uh, even very uh, weak synaptic stimuli, such as a, a single quanta of glutamate released spontaneously, um, and the consequence of this regulation uh, is regulation of the expression level of amber receptors at synapses. And it turns out that there are amber receptors that are added to synapses are actually have, uh, are not like the ones that are already there. So the ones that are, are there in hippocampal neurons anyway uh, uh, all contain the blue A2 subunit. Um, the receptors that are added seem to be homomeric receptors formed exclusively from the blue A1 subunit. And so they lack this critical blue A2 subunit which plays an important role in controlling calcium permeability. So the native receptors are not calcium permeable, the newly added ones are. Uh, and so uh, uh, that has and potentially enormous consequences on the function of these synapses. Isn't, isn't the fact that the newly added ones are molecularly different kind of flying in the face of your underlying assumption that this is an ongoing mechanism? Right, so that's, so that's an interesting uh, point. So it turns out that the ones that are added um, are, uh, they're not there forever. So they actually, the ones that are initially added are glue one homers, but over time, those are slowly, uh, those are, are trapped down and replaced by these native receptors, okay? So, if, uh, so that's actually a good point, um, but an important one, that even though they're adjusting for, for changes in synaptic strength, um, that by doing so, that actually has other consequences for the synapse. And, and the consequence in this case is, is a change in the calcium permeability of the amber receptors, which has, I mean, Rick Huber's lab has shown this has important consequences for the plasticity of these synapses. Um, and uh, uh, so, uh, now whether that's actually sort of uh, the intent of this whole process or a byproduct of it is, uh, remains to be seen. Certainly in, in the case of Rick's data, it seems to be uh, the intent of the process. Okay. So, um, now, what kind of mechanisms might underlie this? Um, and so one of the reasons that, that uh, one of the, the, the interesting aspects is that, uh, this is work from Lu Chen's lab, is that we know that the FMRP protein plays an important role in this aspect uh, of this local homeostatic control. So in FMR1 knockout animals, this 
uh, uh, local synaptic uh, uh, control of, of postsynaptic function is lost, uh, and that's work that her lab has shown. Um, but we also know that there's these presynaptic mechanisms as well, uh, uh, which, and we don't know whether uh, fMRP plays a role in controlling these other forms of synaptic homeostasis. That's, that's something we have to look at. But this prompted us to look at what other types of mechanisms might actually be operating uh, under these circumstances. And I, as I mentioned to you, the mTOR signal pathway we know is a, is a major control point for local translation of synapses. It's also uh, 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 it's also a pathway that's been heavily implicated in autism and intellectual dis disability as well. And so uh, the work, previous work has really focused on mTOR as a postsynaptic regulator. There's really compelling evidence that this pathway is really important for enduring forms of LTP and LTD, uh, and that mTOR is acting essentially on the postsynaptic compartment, either to increase receptor uh, occupancy of synapses or to increase the uh, surface area of spines or possibly both. Um, and so it seemed a, a reasonable idea that mTOR might play a similar role in homeostatic control. Uh, and so that, to address that question, this is work that actually uh, was initiated by Trace Henry, a really talented graduate student in my lab. Uh, he simply asked whether blockade of synaptic drive, does, is that capable of activating the mTOR signaling pathway? And it turns out that it is. This is using one particular readout of the phosphorylation of ribosomal protein S6. And in uh, what, blockade of amber receptors with, with CNQX drives a, a pretty rapid increase in mTOR C1 activation. Um, that's seen not only in, in phosphor 6, but also other uh, mTOR, uh, uh, other uh, downstream mTOR signaling proteins such as 4BB1 and p 70 s 6 kinase. Uh, and this is uh, blocked by uh, the mTOR C1 specific inhibitor, rapamycin. Okay, so blockade of synaptic drive does activate mTOR. Uh, does it participate in these, uh, in this rapid uh, postsynaptic compensation that uh, amber receptor blockade drives? Um, and the answer to that question actually turned out to be a little bit surprising. So we were expecting that mTOR would play a role in these postsynaptic uh, compensatory mechanisms since a similar role has essentially been described in cases of LTP and LTD. But what we found actually is that the amplitude of these, these miniature currents in the presence of CNQX were scaled equally well regardless of whether mTOR was uh, inhibited with rapamycin blocking TORC1 or an active site mTOR inhibitor, C4-1, which would block uh, conceivably TORC1 as well as TORC2. So mTOR did not seem to be required for, these, for the uh, increase in postsynaptic strength uh, driven uh, by amber receptor blockade. What it was important for, however, were these increase in the frequency of miniature uh, postsynaptic currents, which uh, we previously shown required a presynaptic expression mechanism. So, uh, mTOR seemed to play a role not in regulating postsynaptic compensation, but in regulating presynaptic compensation, which was uh, unexpected and, and, and puzzling. And so the question is, is mTOR operating in a postsynaptic cell to drive these presynaptic compensatory mechanisms? Um, and so to address that question, uh, Trace took advantage of the fact that uh, uh, our transmission uh, strategies in neurons generally are pretty poor. Uh, he actually systematically made them worse. Uh, and so uh, what he came up with is a strategy, um, uh, a transmission strategy that essentially targeted less than 1% uh, of the neurons in the culture. So uh, typically about five neurons or so per 50,000 neurons would actually express uh, uh, trans uh, transfecting constructs. And he did this on purpose so that he could transfect these neurons with uh, a form of mTOR that's rapamycin resistant. Um, so here's just the strategy, this is a, a GFP. Uh, transfection um, where the neuron expressing GFP is shown here. Uh, and this is surrounded by a bunch of GFP negative neurons, of course, that were not transfected, but uh, are, are in this very dense uh, network. So basically, you can, you can target this one individual neuron and not have the other neurons in the network affected. Okay, so not, not too surprising. But it's important for this consideration because when this is applied postsynaptically and record from the cell, most of the presynaptic inputs, almost all of them, in fact, um, will be coming from neurons with unperturbed mTOR signaling. So we can really look at the consequence of manipulating TOR in the postsynaptic versus presynaptic environment. And so what Trace did is he, he um, took advantage of the fact that rapamycin blocks uh, mTOR by interacting with another protein, FKD1, 
And a mutants in mTOR have been generated that no longer bind FTB1, and so they're rapamycin resistant. Okay? So we used one of these mutants, expressed it in these neurons, and then applied rapamycin uh, to the culture. So basically, and under those conditions, this neuron has mTOR activity, but the rest of the neurons in the culture do not. Okay? And uh, the question was, is this sufficient to rescue uh, these presynaptic changes uh, induced by hyperreceptive blockade? Okay? And, and the answer to that question is yes, it is. So uh, just uh, direct your attention here to the, to the bar, so maybe that'll be easiest. So uh, in the presence of the rapamycin resistant mTOR, and the rapamycin, so rapamycin normally blocks this increase in presynaptic function, but uh, expression of rapamycin resistant mTOR completely rescues it. Okay? So you only need mTOR activation in the postsynaptic compartment in order to drive these presynaptic changes. Um, so Trace next wanted to ask whether these changes were in fact mediated by local mTOR uh, dependent regulation. And so for that he used a slightly different optical approach. Um, he took advantage of, a, of a, uh, an antibody that Tom Sudhoff's lab had made a number of years ago uh, where uh, uh, the, ant the antigen was the luminal domain of synaptotagmin 1. Okay? And so the idea is that we use live labeling of this antibody that normally targets the inside of the synaptic vesicle, and so it's really not going to have any access to its epitope unless synaptic vesicles fuse at the plasma membrane. Um, and in that case, then we will label uh, that synaptic vesicle uh, in the synaptic terminal. Um, so what Trace did is use a, a piggybacked on an approach that we had previously developed where we use a very limited uh, uh, incubation time, about five minutes or so, uh, in the presence of TTX to suppress all firing, uh, to basically look at uh, presynaptic function using this reader. It's essentially, presynaptic function that is read out as an increase in the uptake of synaptic tagging at these presynaptic terminals, which we can examine independently and structurally by staining for the vesicular glutamate transport. Okay? And so the reason that Trace wanted to do this is he wanted to ask whether blocking M4 signaling locally prevented the, cha the presynaptic changes that we observe in a spatially restricted fashion or not. Um, and so what he did is he back applied scene connects, so amber receptors were blocked everywhere, and then locally supplied uh, rapamycin. Uh, and then following this uh, procedure for two hours, he then did this rapid live labeling with the synaptic antibody, fixed the neurons, and then stain them for a structural marker of excitatory synapses V blue one. And you can see even from this image, this is a, a, an image taken after the staining, you can see that the uptake of the synaptic tagman antibody is severely diminished in this region treated um, with rapamycin. But the uh, expression of V blue one is actually not affected. Okay. So this is quantified here. Um, so when C and QX is not applied, Local supply of rapamycin causes a decrease in synaptotagmin uptake in the affected region um, without a change in v glut one uh, expression. So structurally, the synapses are there, but functionally, they're not working uh, as well. Now, it turns out that if you leave out the amber receptor uh, block A, uh, you don't see this effect. So the effects of local mTOR inhibition really depend on um, the fact of uh, the situation where amber receptor blockade is really driving this process. Okay, so this is not a, uh, a constitutive role for mTOR uh, in regulating increasing epic function. This is something that's driven specifically under these homeostatic uh, compensation conditions. All right, so, um, so mTOR seems to be required postsynaptically and locally for this uh, presynaptic compensation. Uh, is it sufficient to drive it? Um, uh, and this is an important question because uh, uh, the question really is, uh, do downstream mTOR C1 targets directly participate in this feedback control of presynaptic function, um, or do they need other combinatorial signals in order to achieve that function? So to address that question, Trace uh, used his transfection approach and expressed um, uh, red Q64L, sort of red, uh, which is the uh, GTB binding protein that directly uh, uh, participates in activating mTOR. Um, and it used a form of REV that is persistently in a GTP-bound GTP state uh, called rev pc 4 l uh, Transfected neurons with us and then examined uh, mTOR C1 signaling again using phosphorylation of rev protein S6 as a readout. And you can see that in this condition that this transfected cell has uh, significantly upregulated mTOR signaling relative to its neighbors. So this approach generally works. 
We can get activation of mTOR signaling in individual postsynaptic neurons. And so now the question is, is this sufficient to drive this increase um, in presynaptic function? Okay? And uh, this is now uh, read out using uh, mini frequency again as a readout of presynaptic function. Uh, and it turns, it, it, it turns out that it is. That driving mTOR signaling postsynaptically increases the, the uh, function of presynaptic terminal synapsing on that neuron. Yes? Um, so a question. Um if I remember correctly, the cells in culture, the culture, they actually form all the synapse. So, uh, uh, autopsis? Yeah, they, 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 they make synapses. Uh, it's a great, yeah, it's a great, it's a great point. So, uh, they only do that under conditions where the density is very, very low. So, under these conditions, they actually have no autopsis at all. Uh, that's a, that's a good question. So, um, so driving mTOR signaling postsynaptically is uh, uh, induces compensation or, or, or enhancement of presynaptic terminal synapsing on that neuron. Um, now, this suggests, of course, that something that mTOR is regulating is being released um, in a way that communicates back to presynaptic terminals. And through a variety of experiments that I won't tell you about, uh, we were able to identify, this is actually first identified by Sonia Jackowicz, a graduate student in my lab, um, that that uh, uh, signaling molecule is actually brain-derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF. And uh, as one uh, experiment uh, to look at this, um, trace expressed uh, rebq 6 4 l uh, in, in the presence of track BFC. And this is a, 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 a BDNF, this is the track B, the BDNF binding region of track B, fused the FC portion of an antibody and then applied extracellularly. So it acts essentially as a BDNF scavenger. Um, when BDNF is released, when the post synaptic neuron is picked up by the scavenger and it prevents it from binding to endogenous track B receptors on these presynaptic terminals. And so, in the presence of track BSC, you can see that this presynaptic modulation is, by mTOR signaling is completely suppressed. So, mTOR post synaptic drives these changes. Does, do these changes in many frequency actually reflect true changes in presynaptic function? And do those changes extend? to only spontaneously release glutamate, or do they apply to glutamate that's actually released by an action potential? Um, uh, there's lots of evidence, actually, that, that uh, mechanisms controlling evoked release and those controlling spontaneous release have been subtly, are subtly different. That's been known for some time. But there's very clear examples now where one form of transmission is modulated and the other is not. And actually, Pete Winter's lab has a great example of this in recent paper, um, where spontaneous transmission is selectively regulated Cannabinoids in the, in the developing uh, chicks. So, does this extend to a both uh, release? And so, we use sort of an electrophysiology trick to address this question. Well, we can record from those red Q64L expressing neurons and then look at release probability fairly directly um, by taking advantage of the use dependent blockade of NMDA receptor currents by the open channel blocker MK01. Okay, so. MK01 uh, requires the NMDA receptors to open before it blocks. And if you stimulate uh, presynaptic release uh, in the presence of MK01 to record NMDA receptor currents, basically the rate of blockade gives you uh, a pretty uh, uh, a reliable and selective readout of release probability at those affected synapses. So under control conditions, uh, and so the, the, the long and the short of it here is that activation of mTOR signal with REV overexpression accelerates the blockade of these NMDA receptor currents with by MK01, right? Uh, strongly suggesting an increase in release probability at those synapses. But this is coming from only when mTOR signaling is confined to the postsynaptic cell. So this can provide very strong evidence that, that mTOR signaling postsynaptically is driving presynaptic compensation. Uh, uh, in those terminals that are synapsing on that affected neuron. Uh, and like we saw before, uh, inclusion of track BFC uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, completely prevents this rapid, uh, uh, this increased uh, uh, rate of blockade with MK01. So um, uh, this is just looking at these first five, these first five points here, summarized in a histogram. Um, you can see this faster blockade of red Q64L, and this is prevented when uh, uh, the neurons have been treated with track BFC, showing that BDNF is a necessary downstream effector of uh, mTOR signal. So uh, this suggested, of course, mTOR plays a major role in control of translation at synapses. It suggested that perhaps BDNF might be a translational target of TOR signaling. 
Uh, and we know from uh, lots of recent work, actually, that eaten fMRNAs, uh, several different species, are transported to dendrites. Uh, and um, they are differentially translated. Uh, U.A. Feng's uh, work suggests that there's a, a differential translation of the long and the short uh, of eaten fMRNAs that contain a long and a short form pre uh untranslated region. Uh, uh, and that the, tra the transport of eaten fMRNAs is heavily influenced by both the 3 prime ETR as well as the 5 prime ETR. So if eaten fMRNA is in dendrites, uh, mTOR, so what, what are the, con is it regulated um, in, in, a, in a protein synthesis kind of fashion? Um, and so we first actually examined this question using amber receptor blocking. This was an observation that Sonia Jackwich had made, uh, which is very striking. And I'm actually going to turn the lights up one more time. Um, so you can see this. So uh, under normal conditions, BNF is, is most prominently expressed in the cell body, but you can actually see it expressed throughout the dendrite. Um, uh, but when we block amber receptors for two hours and look at the somatodendritic distribution of BNF, you can see that the, somat that the distribution of the soma doesn't really change very much, but the, but the dendritic expression increased markedly. Um, and so this was very puzzling to us. Uh, but it did suggest that the dendritic, uh, that the BNF population in dendrites was being selectively regulated by this amber receptor blockade condition. And it turns out that when we looked at mTOR signal, we saw exactly the same effect. That when we, when we overexpress red Q64L or wild type red, we see um, an increase in BNF expression, but this is largely confined to the dendrites. Uh, we don't see any changes in the cell body. Uh, but we do know that mTOR signaling is actually being regulated in a cell-wide fashion. So for whatever reason, dendritic BNF seems to respond selectively. And there's actually lots of reason now to, think, to understand why this is the case. Um, we know that different BNF mRNA populations are targeted for dendrites, and uh, our hypothesis is that um, those targets, those mRNAs are selectively sensitive to TOR activation, and the other mRNAs are not. But we're still testing that idea. Okay, so but suffice it to say that, that BDNF uh, expression is selectively controlled in dendrites even when we overactivate mTOR signaling. So um, the question then is, does it really participate in this adaptive compensation, the synthesis itself? And uh, uh, to get access to that question, we actually uh, uh, wanted to uh, devise a, a faster method to drive mTOR signaling. Um, and I'll, you'll, that'll probably be, make sense in, 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 a few, in a few seconds. So we took advantage of work that's been done in non-neural systems uh, using liposomes containing phosphatidic acid and applying these to cells. This has been shown to activate potently mTOR C1 signaling in other cells. And it turns out that it works quite effectively in neurons as well. We treat neurons with phosphatidic acid for 30 minutes. We see a nice increase in phospholysis 6 staining um, indicative of higher mTOR signaling in these neurons. This is uh, very reliable. Um, we can drive mTOR signaling and pass in this fashion. If we drive confine mTOR activation to uh, a short period of time, in this case 45 minutes or 90 minutes, um, do we see the same types of changes in pre synaptic function that we've seen previously? And the answer is yes. So this is an experiment where we uh, activate mTOR signaling for 45 minutes and then <coughs> use a different optical approach to look at uh, pre synaptic function. This is using uh, uh, a secret glutamate transporter that's tagged internally with the pH sensitive fluorine. Um, so, this is B glut fluorine. Uh, and because the, the pH sensitive GFP is inside the synaptic vesicle, uh, the fluorescence is dramatically quenched. And, but when vesicles are being released, such as in response to an action potential, you can see a flash of fluorescence um, uh, in uh, at these synaptic terminals that are related here with uh, anterior synaptic phizin. Uh, and so under normal conditions, if you drive action potentials using uh, uh, field stimulation, uh, you can see an, a marked increase in the fluorescence uh, associated with that, that activation at each one of these individual sites as these synaptic vesicles fuse. Um, but in response, after phosphatidic acid treatment, um, you can see that this evoked release is markedly enhanced um, uh, relative to control conditions. And then again, inclusion of track EFC seems to largely prevent this change. So uh, acute activation of M4C1 signaling uh, drives the same changes in presynaptic function, uh, and they're also they're BDNF dependent in, these, in this case. Um, 
So is BDNF synthesis actually responsible for this? And so uh, we took advantage of the fact that we can drive this process very quickly using phosphatidic acid with another approach to rapidly uh, 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 transfect neurons uh, and, and deliver siRNAs uh, using magnetofection. So um, uh, uh, this is actually an approach that we've got turned on through uh, uh, discussions with Gary uh, 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 using uh, this approach to get uh, other RNA species in the neurons. And um, uh, using siRNA specific for BNF, we can then ask, under what conditions can we actually block the increase of BDNF synthesis with phosphatic acid and not affect basal levels of BDNF uh, in turnover. Um, this was actually a, a, a fairly long set of experiments, but under comparing this with control siRNAs, um, basically uh, uh, Trace looked at this systematically and found a set of conditions where, there, where we could block the increase with phosphatic acid but have really no effect on the basal expression of BDNF. So basically we're not, there isn't sufficient turnover of endogenous BDNF at this time to really have an effect, okay? So under these conditions, a phosphatic acid uh, drives a nice increase in BDNF expression in dendrites in under control siRNA conditions, but not in the case of the BDNF specific siRNAs. And uh, the question is, does, is this sufficient to block uh, this compensatory increase in presynaptic function? And the answer is yes. So BDNF siRNA, um, again, under these conditions, the blocks rapid translation of BDNF completely prevents the increase in the frequency we get when we activate intracellularly uh, with phosphoric acid. So, um, altogether, then, this suggests that, uh, that really local translation has at least two distinct roles in synaptic homogeneous On the one hand, we know that signals regulate uh, the translation machinery to. to uh, in part effects on postsynaptic sensitivity, glutamate, postsynaptic function. Um, and uh, these uh, are most often are associated with increases in the, in the expression of receptors and receptor synapses. But there's evidence actually that NMDA receptors can also be adjusted and regulated in this fashion. Um, so, uh, and we know a little bit about the mechanisms that are involved. I mentioned FMRP from Lu Chen's work. Uh, that's, I, that suggests that, uh, that this. This form of synaptic homeostasis is absent in a model of fragile X syndrome, which is very interesting for us. But there are some other effectors that have been identified as well. We first identify another translational regulator, EF2 kinase, which I won't talk any more about. Um, but EF2 kinase has actually been recently implicated in the rapid antidepressant effects of ketamine um, by Lisa Montage and her colleagues at BT Southwestern. So uh, and they showed actually that a very similar mechanism to what we described is EF2 kinase regulating. Uh, this uh, increase in synaptic uh, efficacy in response to, uh, to NMDA receptor blockade is actually responsible. So there's some evidence that this translational control regulating synaptic homeostasis might have other physiological uh, effects uh, outside of uh, intellectual disability causes. Uh, Lu Chen's lab has also identified retinoic acid as a major regulator of the translation necessary for this. As I mentioned, FMRP we know is also involved. So there's a major task here of trying to put these different components together into a coherent story, but clearly translational control is a major regulator of this synaptic homeostasis on the postsynaptic side. Now the interesting one, I think, that obviously I think it's interesting because I just talked about it, but uh, is the, this role of mTOR signal. Uh, so mTOR we know can play a role postsynaptically, but for whatever reason in synaptic homeostasis it doesn't seem to have that role. It seems to play actually a selective role in regulating uh, the function of the presynaptic compartment through the synthesis and release of BDNF. And there's many, many holes to the story, obviously, that we need to fill. Um, but it is consistent with a lot of the data that's out there. It's consistent with work from uh, uh, many labs showing that BDNF is actually synthesized and released in dendrites, but also uh, consistent with work from Dick Chen's lab looking at BDNF as a, as a retrograde signaling molecule during homeostatic plasticity. Um, and there's an interesting story actually published by Paige Mahigiji's lab in Drosophila, where very much the same mechanism was discovered in the neuromuscular junction, driving a similar homeostatic increase in presynaptic function. Um, so I'm really excited about that because that suggests that these, this regulation conferred by mTOR signaling is actually an evolutionarily conserved and probably has very broad roles in mediating this retrograde transynaptic control 
uh, of symmetric function, which could actually be one of the uh, aspects of, of why its dysfunction leads to uh, intellectual disability and autism. Okay, and so the last little piece of this, I didn't spend any time talking about this, I would just like to point out that none of this is actually set in stone. So uh, these local mechanisms uh, are important, but they also operate within the context or the state of the system, uh, they interact with the state of the system. And, and Sonia uh, made a very important discovery in, in my lab where she found that, that these presynaptic changes were actually completely dependent on the presynaptic terminal being recently active. And we know that calcium influx through PQ and n type voltage gated calcium channels plays a major role in gating these lasting effects of BDNF on regulating presynaptic function. So even though there's this important role for the postsynaptic signaling, it still requires a, a certain permissive state in the presynaptic terminal. Um, and so, so uh, there's several different layers of regulatory control. Local translation is really only one. Okay, so I'm going to skip that this part of the talk and. Uh, uh, so end by uh, thanking the individuals who did the work. So um, uh, most of the work that I talked about today uh, was uh, the work of Trace Henry, who did all the mTOR signaling work, a really talented graduate student in the lab. Um, this, uh, uh, the, the pre-mutation model mice uh, was a collaboration between my lab and the atomic lab. Uh, Adam Eilert did all the electrophysiology. He's a graduate student in my lab. Abby Renault is a graduate student that I share with Peter. Uh, she did most of the imaging of Stephen's neurosome work. Um, and Sonia Jack, which uh, was a former graduate student in my lab, she's now a postdoc at Harvard with Kevin Staley, uh, studying pediatric epilepsy. Um, and she did uh, a really beautiful work looking at how homeostatic control can actually be gated by these sort of state dependent factors in pre static terminals. Uh, and I'd like to end just by, again, pointing out that Aaron Johnson Venkatesh, a very talented postdoc in the lab. Who uh, unfortunately, for doesn't study local translation, but he does very beautiful work and actually will be on the job market uh, within the next year or so. So keep your eye out for her. Thank you very much for all your attention.